authority. We just sang about God's authority. In the Old Testament, I only found two places where the word authority is placed right alongside the name of God. One of them is in Job 34, 13, and the other are these words from Isaiah 30, 30. And the Lord will cause his voice of authority to be heard. While God's authority is evident throughout the Old Testament, um, the word is predominantly found in the New Testament. Only twice in the Old Testament, but almost 94 times in the New Testament do we find the word authority. Authority refers to God having the freedom to decide. He has complete freedom to decide what he wants to do and what he will do. But that's not all. The word authority carries also the right to act. So he has the freedom to choose and then to act according to his choice. And there is no hindrance when God decides to act or to choose. He's completely free to do either one, just as he wishes. So he always completes the action that he begins. And that's what authority is. God has the prerogative to do with man as he wishes. Romans chapter 9 and verse 21. And God also has the prerogative to set dates and to set times for events to take place. And once he determines that date, it is set. It will take place just as he intended it to. So, <clears throat> in today's four verses, the first four verses of the book of Titus, I found God making authoritative decisions. And I found evidence that he accomplished what he purposed to do. And it's all in these four verses. He decides to do much and use Paul as his instrument to either do something or communicate something that is part of God's will. So Paul is very involved in what he's going to be sharing with us when he talks about God having authority and the power to accomplish what he says he's going to do. So that's why I've titled today's message, Authority and Action. What God decides to do, he, it will take place. And so we're going to look at these four verses with this in mind. I won't ask you to stand, but if you would please find the book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Titus 1, 1 through 4. Paul, a bondservant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ. For the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. But at the proper time manifested his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Let's pray together. As Joshua mentioned, there is the true God for who he is. 
and you have described yourself, Lord, in the scriptures. You're not to be made an idol or an image of something that's not true of you, either physically or in our hearts. We're so grateful that today we're privileged to have this portion of your word for us to consider. It says so much about you and your decisions and how you follow through and accomplish your decisions, your authority, and your actions. And that you've chosen to use men, believers, as instruments by which you work. In this case, the Apostle Paul. We're thankful that you led him. The Holy Spirit guided him in writing these words about the ministry that you have to accomplish your glorification and your plan for salvation and growth in the Christian life. May we take these words that are truth and understand them through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, would you illuminate, give understanding to us as we go through these verses. May we be receptive and where we don't understand completely, may we just trust you and keep studying your word so that we might know you for who you really are and give you praise from the heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. These four verses are actually one sentence in the Greek language, even though they don't have periods and all that. It's the longest salutation in Paul's letters other than the epistle to the Romans. So it's a very long introduction. It's his way of beginning the message. And it, has, it is packed. It is packed with so many things that Paul needed to share as the Holy Spirit led him. I tried to summarize the four verses into one sentence, a short sentence. And uh, so I just want to give it to you. And my sentence has three parts. The first part, Paul identifies himself. That's the first half of the first verse. Paul identifies himself and he identifies God's purpose for him in people's lives. And that covers the second half of verse 1 all the way through verse 3. God's purpose for Paul in people's lives. So that's what he's going to be describing. And then he concludes in verse 4 by saying one of those purposes of ministering to all these people included Titus. Titus' life. Because Titus was saved through Paul's ministry. So just to kind of make it without all the added information, Paul identifies himself and he identifies God's purpose for him in people's lives, including Titus's life. And that summarizes all four verses. I want to start with Paul, how he identified himself. It's in two ways. He says, I'm a bondservant of God, and I'm also an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Greek word for bondservant is doulos, and it literally means slave, not the word bondservant. Though some translations even use the word servant or bondservant for the word doulos. Well, the difference is that servants are hired. And some of these servants work for a master because they're indebted to the master. So they've got to work for him. But a doulos 
is a slave that's owned by the master. Whereas servants weren't necessarily owned. So here we have Paul making it very clear that he belongs to a particular master. In this case, Paul is exclusively owned by God. And therefore, he defines himself, his very existence, his mission, all of his activities are in subjection to and subservient to God, his master, his benevolent master. Paul saying, I'm owned by the one who saved me. Christians are also called a variety of things in the New Testament. You can take the name ambassador, which is one of the words that describes believers. Children of God is another one. But the one that is most often used to describe a believer is the word slave slave it's used over or nearly excuse me 40 times in the new testament to describe us do you consider yourself a slave of god or a slave of the lord jesus christ or might it be that you kind of look at yourself as i i get to choose what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I'm going to do it. Because then, you're not really a slave, you're the one in charge of your own life. And sadly, there are many believers who are just not taught or do not care to be in the role of a slave to God. So that's why I asked this question. Do you consider yourself a slave? Is that how you think of your being and your existence? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 is a very familiar passage, and it's well worth listening to it again. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price you've been bought. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You, we should be living to honor and glorify God by living His way with His resources for His glory, serving Him, not moi. All right? And that passage is very clear. The Lord Jesus Christ bought you. He paid for you by giving His life up on the cross and dying for you. That's your purchase price and he did that to save you and so that he could take you and say you're mine i own you you are my precious possession he's a benevolent master at salvation you became a possession of god praise the lord Amen. wow so with benevolent authority, God uses his power to make Paul his own slave. God's in authority. God's in control. God's in charge. God has the power, and he went to Paul when Paul was out to kill Christians. And he changed his life. God can do as he pleases with whomever he wishes and how he comes to that person. And it's all 
right and good, in spite of what maybe the world might think. The greatest privilege we ever have in life is that God owns us as his slave. Well, Paul identifies himself not only as a slave of God, but also as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. The particular kind of service that God wanted Paul to do for him is called an apostolic ministry. The word apostle basically means the person sent forth. It's found 79 times in the New Testament. And it has a primary and a secondary usage. Barnabas, for instance, is called an apostle, and several others are called apostles. And they were commissioned by a church, the church at Antioch, for instance, to send them out, to send them forth, to go do a ministry in God's name. And when the church sent them out, they called them apostles because that's what the term means. That is a secondary usage for the word apostle. The primary and more narrow usage is what we're familiar with, the 12 apostles. And in this case, they were all commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And that's what happened to Paul. Jesus came to Paul in a bright light on the road to Damascus and called him and saved him and said, this is how I'm going to use you. Now you go to Damascus and you go to this place. So God was authoritative. He claimed him and he told him what to do. And Paul went and did it. He had seen the Lord and he was willing to follow his Lord. Well, this is the uh, primary narrow use of the word apostle. And so we are very grateful that God called these men to go do what he told them to do. And they obeyed unto death. Their life was less to them than sharing the gospel and obeying their master. That was more important to them. I want us, as we begin Titus, to begin to see this is what Paul lays out, not just because he's an apostle and the other 12, but this is true of all of us. We have been sent out. We've been told, go into all the world and share the good news wherever you live and whomever you might be with where you have the opportunity to talk about the Lord Jesus. So this is how the letter begins. And as you can tell, God's in charge here. And he's telling us, this is your way to serve me. This is my plan. And, and you're here saved to serve me in the ministry that I want to have for the whole world. Well, Paul's salutation begins with self-identification, um, a slave and an apostle. It's followed immediately by a very important word. If you look back on verse 1 where it says, and that Paul is also an apostle of Jesus Christ for... That is a critical word in the passage, believe it or not. It's just a preposition. But the word for in this location here in Titus means for the purpose of. In other words, I've been called as an apostle by the Lord Jesus Christ for a particular purpose. And what he does from this point on to the end of verse 3 is he describes four aspects of what the purpose is in God using him. And we're going to go over those, uh, one at length and the other three kind of quickly. <clears throat> it's just the way the Lord worked this out for me. So part two of Paul's salutation is he's declaring 
God's purpose for me in people's lives begins with this first aspect for the faith of those chosen of God. That's the first aspect that Paul is declaring. This is what God called me to do. This is part of my purpose, and I'm going to go do it. What is Paul's role in being called to the faith of those chosen of God? What is his role? Well, the Apostle Paul was commanded to go take the gospel message, and that's very clear in verse 3. But I won't turn there right now, but it's very clear. This is what God told me to do. Take the gospel everywhere. And part of my role is to take the gospel, and even though I don't know who God has chosen in the crowds and wherever I go, but I'm going to give the gospel so that those that God chose will respond in faith and be saved. Okay, so that's what he's saying is my role, my number one part of being called by God to go do his work. The way that Paul puts it in verse 2 illuminates the authority that God has in salvation. You see, God is saying, I've already chosen some before Paul even goes out. And so when he preaches the gospel, those that I've chosen are going to be responding to the gospel in faith and trust me, the Lord Jesus, to save them. So we have something here that particularly captured my attention, and I'll just let you know, when I first heard this, I, I didn't do too well. In a sense, I didn't like what it said. God could care less. <laughs> it's still in the Bible, whether I like it or not, back then. Chosen. He calls them chosen of God. The word means selected. Like he did with Paul on the road to Damascus. He came and he selected Paul to be his. That's what this word is referring to. God selected certain ones to become his. When did God select those people? Well, Ephesians 1, 3, Paul declares there, quote, he chose us, Paul talking about himself, and everybody else, he chose us in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world. So if we go back and we go before the world was created, before the universe was created, what is left? God. God is the only one in existence. And it was in that time before he created anything, he already decided, because he knows everything, I'm going to choose Joshua Cook. I'm going to choose Jana Cook now uh, to become mine. And it's just a matter of time before they're going to hear the gospel. And when I call them, they're going to come to me when they hear the gospel and put their faith in me. That is what he's communicating, and this was decided before Joshua and Jana or any of us were even alive. Nothing existed. Well, this, this, um, this is not just one time in the Bible that God talks about choosing people before the foundation of the world. If you could go back two pages, maybe, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Two pages in your Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. 
it gives us a little bit more detail uh, about the chosen of God. Look with me at verse 10, 2 Timothy 2. For this reason, I, Paul talking, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Well, it's very clear here that Paul is talking about enduring things when he shares the gospel. You may know he was stoned. He was beaten. He was mistreated. He was put in chains. He was imprisoned. Um, all these things simply because he's telling people the gospel. But he says, even though I was beaten black and blue, I was left for dead. I wouldn't stop. God commanded me. My life is of no account compared to the ministry for God that I'm doing. And so I continued to share the gospel. And then he said that, that they also, like me, may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. So as Paul shared the gospel and God said, come, they responded in faith that they could be forgiven, they could trust Jesus alone to have died for their sin, paid their payment, and trust him. Not only to save them, but as Paul says here, that I will have eternal glory. Jesus' resurrected body, I'm going to have one just like it. That's part of his promises of eternal glory. So Paul endured so that he could continue to communicate the gospel to people. He proclaimed it. Paul did not know who in all these crowds or all these peoples was chosen. No one knows who's been chosen. And the only hint we have is after a person becomes saved and there is a change in their life and they belong to Jesus and they're not the same person, we can say, you know what? Now that you're saved, now we know God chose you before the foundation of the world. Well, there are lots of places in the Bible that God talks about choosing sinners ahead of time that they're going to come know the gospel and be saved. But it still remains a controversial topic among Christians and even among unbelievers. So I want to give us some counsel about this truth that God chose ahead of time. Who would be saved? Because it also tells us if he didn't choose, these other people will not be saved. So let's be very careful because Satan would want to tempt us with sinful thoughts toward God using this truth that's in the Bible. This might be something along the lines of what he might put in our minds in the temptation. It's not right for God to choose and then to choose some. That's wrong. And that's what I thought years ago myself. So we need to be very careful because Satan would want to become using that temptation to become divisive in our church, in our family. So we need to be very careful. 
because our thoughts will take us somewhere. We'd be accusing God of doing something wrong. There is another part of us that needs to be um, checked. It's called our flesh. Uh, Our flesh may tempt us to disagree and associate God's choosing with something that is unjust. Thirdly, we also need to be careful not to let what the world thinks about God choosing. And the world, in this case, can be unbelievers or even believers. If I'm going to look at what some believers say and, well, I can't really believe this because, well, they're saying I'm wrong or that that's not right or that's not the way to interpret it. So I have to make my decision on what I'm going to believe by the fear of man. What others say. What am I doing? I'm putting them ahead of what God says. So I really need to fear God and not put the fear of man as the one to tell me how I should believe. So these three areas, I think we need to be very careful. Um, And then I want to add this. Anytime you are questioning, have hesitation, or maybe somebody's coming across so strong that you just want to throw up because they're trying to force you to believe the kind of interpretation that they have about God choosing. I think what we need to do primarily is attach scripture about God if you're wondering about God choosing ahead of time, such as holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Isaiah 6.3, he is absolutely holy. He cannot do evil, cannot has never, will never, do anything evil. Another verse, Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Quote, His work is perfect. For all His ways are just. See, I need to put that in with being chosen before anything was created. All his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. So now I need to do what the scripture says. Lord, you are righteous in choosing people before the foundation of the world. It is not a sin. It is not evil. That doesn't mean I understand or that I can heartily agree at this point in my life. But God is not sinning. Paul didn't make a mistake when he wrote this verse out. It's the truth. And I don't expect you to figure it all out. I hope you don't expect me to figure it all out. I just believe the God of the Bible says, this is what I do because I'm authoritative. I am righteous. I am without sin. And I never do anything wrong. One more. And I love this one because it puts me in my place. And then I feel more relaxed. Are you ready? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God speaking. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor 
Are your ways my ways, says God. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. None of us completely have it figured out, and you can't unless you're God. You never will. But I believe God's word. And so I accept it, and I encourage you to accept it. This is the first purpose that Paul states for which God sent him out. It's to share the gospel, the good news of salvation, so that those that God has chosen will come to faith and trust Jesus. There is a second aspect, second reason, second purpose. God called Paul to give, to teach the knowledge of the truth, like we just did. Teach the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. I want to make something very clear. Godliness cannot be separated from knowing the truth. If you know the truth, it will change the way you live. When I knew the truth that I loved that woman, it changed my life. I was not the same guy, was I? And she knew where I was coming from when that point came. When Paul teaches the truth, it should change the way I live. When I understand the truth, then my godly living should increase. Now, what's this letter about? How many times does Paul talk about good deeds and evil men and doing things for gain? This whole island of Crete is ungodly in many ways. And the problem is that the churches in Crete weren't very far behind. They were not living godly lives. So Paul is saying, I'm giving this letter to Timothy because I know that the truth, if it's taught and the spirit is there, it'll begin to change the people and they will be living godlier lives. That's why we're going through this epistle. This epistle. To Titus. It's not just so that you can have more knowledge or I can understand more knowledge. That puffs up the head. It's so that, oh Lord, change my life, my thoughts, my intentions, my motives, my behavior, my language, so that you will be glorified. That's the second purpose for Paul giving this letter to Titus and for Paul's ministry. And he's passing it on to Titus. There's a third aspect involving God's use of Paul. And uh, this is uh, in verse 2. I want you to teach, Paul, the hope of eternal life, which I, God, and I can't lie, I promised eternal life. Long ages ago. Now, this is just another way of saying long ago in times eternal. When there was nothing created, when it was just eternity, I promised I'm going to take the people I save to have eternal life with me forever and ever. And they will have eternal glory. So, God makes a promise, he doesn't lie. It will take place. You will be glorified with Jesus for eternity. And we'll be there together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So this is another reason, Paul, uh, this word hope is not, I strongly desire this to be true. Or... Maybe, you know, sometimes people say, I hope this happens. Maybe, 
No, this hope is based on God's promise. It is absolutely true. It will take place. And Paul, I want you to teach it like that with confidence because I, my name, I stand on this. The fourth and final aspect of what Paul purposes to accomplish through Paul in people's lives, here we have it, at the proper time, manifest my word. To manifest means to reveal. Folks don't know. They don't have the revelation of the scriptures, Paul. So this is what I particularly want you to do. And of all of them, I want you to proclaim how people are saved. And Paul says, that's what I was entrusted to do by God. He entrusted me with the gospel. As a matter of fact, he commanded me. God, our Savior, commanded me. He didn't say, would you like to do this? Would you pretty please? No. God said, Paul, I am telling you, go share the gospel. Teach people the truth. Reveal everything that I've shared with you. And Paul said, yes, Lord. That's part of our plan. Paul is giving this to Titus. Now, Titus, you go do it. And, and the scripture by application says, Nathan, I want you to go. I want you to tell people, Ramiro, Joshua, all of us that are saved, I want you to reveal what people don't know about how to be saved. Paul identifies himself, a slave, an apostle. And he identifies God's purpose for him among the people. And we, we did it one at a time. Number one, share the gospel because through the gospel, I will call those I've chosen and they will come to have faith in, in me to be saved. Number two, I want you to teach the truth and that the truth always changes into godly living. Take that home. If I'm reading the scriptures and I'm praying, I should be living more godly. And where you're not, say, Lord, this I need help right here. Help me, Holy Spirit. Third, I want you to declare the eternal life promise that I've made because it will come true, and they need to know that. And if I could just, as a sideline, people don't believe in hell. It's true. I think it's mentioned 11 times in the New Testament. And Jesus spoke the word hell 10 out of the 11 times. So Jesus says there is a hell. And it is a real place. And lastly, fourth, God commanded and entrusted Paul with preaching, revealing the scriptures and particularly the gospel. That there is a saving Messiah. Titus, you take it now to Crete. Paydens, Sandy, every one of us, take it. I'm sending you. Lord, we're very grateful for your goodness today to bring practically what this is all about in the first four verses. And that we have a calling and that we're your slaves, and you're the benevolent master who saved us. And it began way back before in eternity. And you chose me, and then you brought it about. You not only have the authority, you took action and accomplished my salvation. And Lord, now we ask as a church, grow us in godly living. Grow us in being active to talk to other people about your gospel, your beautiful person, all that you did. 
to save lost sinners. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.